house of the Lord this morning. Let's stand up and give him praise. Oh, you're worthy, Jesus. We come to magnify your name. We come to lift you high. We exalt you, Jesus. Good. 
day to be in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Shake it every hand and tell him it's good to be here.
anyone in the house of the Lord here this morning? Anybody excited to be in the house on a beautiful Sunday morning? Excited that the lights were on when you came in and someone was having a move of God? Well, I just have one quick announcement for you. A reminder to everyone that's here, even our guest. We are having a play here tonight, so we're not going to be having a regularly scheduled service, but that play will be starting at 6 o'clock tonight, and the doors will be opening at 5 o'clock. Um, I heard it was a really good time yesterday. I was not able to be in attendance due to my honorary daughter, but we will be in attendance here tonight. So whether she's crying or not, it's just going to be part of the play. She could be a little soprano in the, in the choir one day. I assure you of it. Um, but anyway, 6 o'clock tonight, doors open at 5. Invite some friends, invite some guests in the house, hand out some cards if you go out to eat today, um, and see if we can get, some, get this place filled up. How many enjoyed it yesterday? Enjoyed all the hard work. A lot of time and effort goes into this. And that's all of our announcements for this morning. Remember to be faithful in your tithes and offering. Give on newlifebhm.com or the Church Center app. And how many came to have a move of God here this morning? Anybody come to have some church? Come on. We're not having a service tonight. So if you came to get it, you got to get up out of your pew and get it here this morning. Come on. Did anyone come to shake the foundations of this city with your praise and with your worship? It's a weapon in this place. It's a weapon in this city. Come on. Let's begin to use our weapon here this morning as they sing. Come on, put your hands together, yeah! yeah. How many know we serve a great God? Come on!
it a hallelujah. of God. Come on, church. Yeah. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. Of all the glory, all the praise, all the honor. You are worthy. You are worthy. He's a great, great God. He's a great God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, Somebody clap your hands, all ye people, and shout to God with a voice of triumph. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Come on, somebody lift up a shout of praise all over this place. If you've been redeemed by love divine, why don't you magnify Jesus? Come on, if you've been saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, You've got a reason to praise him. I've got a reason to praise him today. I once was lost in sin. Come on. I was broken and he found me. I didn't have a prayer, but he picked me up out of the miry clay. He set my feet on a rock. He established my goings. He put a new song in my heart. Even praise unto my God. And many shall see it and shall fear and shall trust in the Lord. Is that your testimony here today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at somebody next to you today. 
and tell him when you encounter him, he changes the way that you walk. Yeah. Listen. All over the country last night, they were gathered together in, in stadiums. They were worshiping and praising their God. But the Bible said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There's only one Lord. There's only one faith. There's only one baptism. There's only one God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. Come on, he said, have no other gods beside me. They were, they were shouting. They were dancing. They were running for a lesser God, a temporal God, a God that's going to fade away. In the, in the clubs last night all over Birmingham, they were playing music, they were dancing, they were singing, and they were shouting. But when we come into the house of God, we come doing the same. But we don't come worshiping a temporal God, a God made with men's hands. But we come today to celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Are you glad that you know him today in spirit? And in truth, come on one more time. Why don't you magnify him and exalt his name? We bless your name, Jesus. We worship you. We mag come on. Why don't you do it? Take about 30 seconds and give God some praise that he's worthy of. Take somebody by the hand and tell him, come on, magnify the Lord with me. Let us let us exalt his name together come on take a praise break for just a moment somebody praise him Can somebody give him a hand clap of praise? Clap your hands, all you people, and shout to God with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, he's worthy, he's worthy. Praise God. We've come today to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. If you're a guest in the house, we're so glad that you've come to worship him with us why don't we lift our hands to him right now and magnify him he's here his presence is here he desires to inhabit the praises of his people today somebody praise him as they continue to sing
Step out of your pew and find somebody to pray with. Ladies with ladies and men with men. Let's go ahead and gather together with two or three around us. If you have a need right now, why don't you let those that you're praying with know what your need is. God is here today to answer prayer. He's here to deliver and to set free to the uttermost. your way into that prayer right now. Somebody pray in the Holy Ghost. Somebody punctuate that prayer by speaking in that heavenly language. Pray with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Spirit make an intercession.
We have people praying all over the house right now, but we're going to go to God for some special needs. Sister Sarah's sister's having some medical complications. Is she in here at the moment? I need some ladies to stand in with Sister Sarah for her sister right now. Go to God in prayer. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We want to continue to pray for Sister Linda. She had a successful surgery. But we want to continue to pray the strength and the power of God. Mariah is going to stand in for her mom. If we could get some ladies to stand in with her and pray the power of God. Somebody pray in the name of Jesus. Brother Mike Henderson's in the back. He had a successful surgery. But we want to continue to pray the hand of God on him. I need a couple of men to go and stand with him and pray down the power of God. Sister Jennifer had surgery this week as well. She's having a few complications. Sister Jackie, would you stand in for Jennifer? We had some ladies to come and lay hands on her and pray down the power of God that God would strengthen and heal. Dad, if you would go ahead and stand in for Brad where you are right now and for that family, I need some men of God to go and stand with him and pray the power of God down on his life. Andrew, if you would stand in for Brother Daniel Blash here. I need some young men to come and pray for him. Pray the power of God down on his situation. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I don't know if Sister Cynthia Hagedorn is here, but we need to have some prayer for her. Yeah, she's back there in the back. I need some ladies to stand in and pray for her. Brother Warren's going to stand in for Brother James Williams' brother. He had a, a stroke, and we need God to touch his body. Some men of faith come and stand with him. Come on all over this sanctuary. Find somebody to link up with and pray down the power of God. Press into that prayer. Don't be quick to move out of it. God's spirit is moving right now. You're an intermediary right now between heaven and earth. Somebody press in in that prayer. Somebody pray in the Holy Ghost. Somebody pray an intercessory prayer right now. Come on, the spirit that's in you has the power to travel to where that person is that is in need. You go ahead and link up with somebody right now. If you're standing next to one of our elders or you know somebody near you that has a special need, come on, let the Holy Ghost flow. Let the Spirit minister to the body right now. Somebody say, I, I am clean. What's in the in this house. There's knowledge and wisdom and healing and miracles. Let the gift of God flow up out of you right now.
Praise the Lord if you believe that God hears and answers prayer. Go ahead and give him all the praise and all the thanks this morning. Almighty God, worthy God, holy God, we magnify you. We bless your name, oh God. Has God been good to you? Does anybody here think that he's worthy of all the praise, that he's worthy of the high praise, that he's worthy to be praised according to his excellent greatness? Ah, we magnify you, oh God. It is excellent to be in the Lord's house on a Sunday morning, and we're praising God, and I give God thanks for all the ministries that are going forth, and we appreciate so much the praise group and the musicians and the media team for leading us into worship but there's praise there's ministry going on all over the building uh, yesterday afternoon we gathered for a uh, a christmas drama a christmas play the media and uh, the music and and i don't know how many supporting ministries were gathered around our drama team and their and their work but there are a lot of uh, people uh, putting in a lot of hours on that. It was excellent, and it was a wonderful time of fellowship, memory building for our children. And so we're looking forward to the second edition of that this evening at 6 o'clock. And uh, we're looking forward to what God will do. We had a good number of visitors in the house yesterday, and I know they felt the presence of God. Because anytime you gather with God's people and there's prayer and there's worship, even if it's in a little bit of a non-conventional setting, you're still going to feel the presence of God. So, um, so this evening we look forward to that, and I appreciate all the hard work Sister Gina and that whole crowd has put into the uh, production of this, and we appreciate her and all of these that are working with her. Praise God. So excellent to be in the house of God on a Sunday morning. We're going to continue uh, studying in the Old Testament following our, our pattern here. We're in 1 Kings chapter 12, and... Um, We'll be reading one verse for a text, and then we'll launch. 1 Kings 12 and 17. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. And if you love his word, and if you're glad for his word in your life, let's give him praise and thanks for his word that is forever settled in the heavens. We praise you, O God, and magnify you and thank you for the privilege of handling your word in this house today. We thank you for the seed of it. Let it grow in every heart, in every house. Do it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, praise the Lord. Feel such a wonderful presence of God in this house today. And I understand why David said, take not thy holy presence from me. And David said, in your presence, there's fullness of joy. And so David was an Old Testament character that knew a lot about the Holy Ghost and a lot about the presence of God. Uh, this morning, we're, we're looking at this uh, passage in 1 Kings, and we are continuing a conversation of the nation of Israel post-Solomon. And so you have, um, you have Rehoboam, the son of, of Solomon, who is first king over Israel, and then because of his poor governance and his bad administrative policies, uh, God raises up Jeroboam uh, to take the ten tribes of Israel to the north in a rebellion. But this is the plan of God, and it is in response to all the idolatry that Solomon brings in uh, under uh, all the influence of his many, many wives. And so the place is a train wreck, and Rehoboam is just presiding over a train wreck, and God touches Jeroboam and says, I want you to take the northern ten tribes, and I want you to establish a kingdom in Samaria, and if you do this well, I'll be with you. But Jeroboam does not, and he's afraid that the people will... Uh, will go back to Jerusalem and be reclaimed by what now is Judah Benjamin or those under the control of Rehoboam. And he's afraid that they'll go back to worship because that's where the temple is and that's where the sacrifice is. And so he makes golden calves for them to worship in the, in the mountain of Samaria. And in that breach of the word of God, he brings catastrophe on himself and on that northern kingdom. And uh, so that's the 
setting, or that's essentially the context of where we are. And uh, there was a split then in Israel. Uh, it looks like somebody's going to be baptized or uh, they're getting ready for that right now. We're excited about that. I'll give you a heads up or maybe the media team will show you a picture. But uh, there was a split in Israel. Uh, and here's the, uh, the biblical presentation. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto, unto this day. And it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, they sent him and called him to the congregation and made him king over all of Israel. And there was none that followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled, assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, a hundred and fourscore thousand chosen men, which were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel, to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. They were ready to go to war to, to, to bring this rebellion to a close. But the word of the Lord came unto Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord. You shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. This thing's from God. They hearkened, therefore, to the word of the Lord and returned to depart according to the word of the Lord. And so uh, there is a split in Israel, but they're not going to go to war just yet. In the succeeding generation, they will be in generations, they will be in war quite often, but not in the original separation. And this separation is going to define the, the narrative of the kings and the chronicles and all of the season of Israel's history down to the time that Assyria comes and takes, uh, takes Israel away into captivity and Babylon comes and takes Judah, Benjamin into captivity. And uh, so the northern kingdom is called Israel all throughout the rest of the scripture. The southern kingdom around Jerusalem is called Judah even though it's more than just the tribe of Judah. And so uh, in, in 723, uh, in some time after uh, uh, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, Syria comes down and they lay siege to Samaria and many of the stories in the Old Testament center around some of this activity and the northern ten tribes of Israel go into captivity and they reportedly, historically, Scholarly uh, 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 writings indicate that they never come back. And uh, that happens in 723. And then Babylon comes down and conquers Jerusalem uh, about 120 years later in 596. And so that's where you get the Jews in Babylon and the stories of, Dave, of, of uh, Daniel and the Hebrew 3 and Ezekiel. They are all exilic prophets. And they're, they're there in Babylon and in Media Persia while uh, those Jews are in captivity. Now at the end of 70 years, that, that group is going to come back from Babylon, and they're going to rebuild uh, Jerusalem and the temple and the walls under Nehemiah and Zerubbabel and, uh, and Ezra. And so that's, uh, in a nutshell, uh, that area of history of, uh, of, of Israel. But the kingdom of Israel, formed by Jeroboam's rebellion and established in Samaria, never officially, nationally, comes back from captivity. And so you get, throughout the uh, centuries, you get a tremendous amount of writing and supposition and uh, speculation from historians, both Christian and Jewish and secular. And they all agree that the ten tribes of Israel were assimilated into the surrounding people groups and their host nations and that they never do return. Hence, if you've been reading at any level about, about things having to do with the Bible or you've been listening to podcasts or you've been doing YouTube videos or whatever your, your area of interest is, you've come across the theme of the lost tribes of Israel. And uh, 
the lost tribes of Israel simply is a conversation about the ten tribes to the north under Jeroboam that many years later will go into captivity and they never return. And it is speculated that they are absorbed or they assimilate into the nation groups around them. Here's, uh, here's a piece from my Jewish learning. The lost tribes are one of the biggest mysteries of Jewish history and have inspired multiple theories. Maybe the Igbo Jews of Nigeria are one of the lost tribes. Perhaps the uh, B'nai Menashe in northern India can claim the title or the Pashtun people of Afghanistan or Native Americans. These groups and many more have claimed to be descended from the lost tribes of Israel. The tribes being spoken of are, of course, those of ancient Israel. The Israelites were divided into 12 tribes, not including the Levites who were not landowners. And every tribe was assigned a piece of land in Israel. That was under Moses and Joshua. After King Solomon died in 922, the tribes split into two kingdoms as a result of a power struggle. The northern kingdom consisted of Reuben and Dan and Naphtali and Gad and Asher and Issachar and Zebulun and Ephraim and Manasseh. The southern kingdom was composed of Judah and Simeon and most of Benjamin, and it's referred to generally as Judah. In 722, Assyria invaded Israel, and the northern kingdom was conquered. Many of the people that lived in the northern kingdom were exiled mainly to Assyria and Medea and Aram Naram, and archaeological evidence suggests that they were eventually completely assimilated into these societies. Meanwhile, some alien populations, the Kutha, the Ava, Hamath, and Sepharim, were brought in to settle the northern kingdom, and those groups all ended up assimilating with each other and with the Israelites who remained in the north. And that would be your New Testament biblical Samaritans. They are a little bit Jewish, but they are mixed up with all sorts of other things, hence the uh, disdain that the nation of Israel or the Jews held for the, uh, for the Samaritans. We're, we're about to go down in the water in Jesus' name. Let's just give God some praise and magnify him. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Well, praise God. That's pretty exciting stuff. Praise God. In case you are uh, new to the idea, baptism is introduced by John the Baptist in the, uh, in the uh, gospel record. And he is projecting that into what we would know as the church age. And uh, so water baptism is always in the scripture by immersion, never by sprinkling. And from the book of Acts all the way through the epistles, the, the mode of baptism is always in the name of Jesus. And that's how the apostles baptize. And that's how all the early church baptized and were baptized. And so that's what you're seeing going on there today. And Jesus said, except you be born of the water and of the spirit, you can't get in. And so uh, you, you know how important this is. And so this is beautiful. And they're praying for this individual right now. And uh, I believe God's going to fill them with the Holy Ghost. So they're praying for that right now. Praise God, and that's worth shouting about, and that's worth praising God about. Well, glory. <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> Praise God. <clears throat> so, yeah, and see, they're making noises. That's what they heard in Acts chapter 2 when this was noised abroad. It drew a big crowd of people, but there was 120 of them, and they were out in an open air, uh, open air area, and so it was re resonating all up and down those little streets in Jerusalem. And it kind of sounded like that, because when you get the Holy Ghost and you're praising God, that's how you sound. You don't sound like this. That's, that's not how you sound when you come to God, and that's not how you sound when you get the Holy Ghost. Well, praise God. They were so active and, and, and uh, invested in that movement, the people in the street thought they were drunk. Yeah, so it kind of gives you a, an idea of what they might have been um, involved in. All right, 586 B.C., the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar attacks the southern kingdom and exiles a lot of that population. That's where the Valley of Dry Bones comes from. 
Those people were murdered, slaughtered outside Jerusalem in a valley there on their way. They just killed them by the tens of thousands. And that's where Ezekiel walked when those bones were laying bleached in the sun. And uh, though many lost their Israelite identity in Babylon, plenty of them retained their connection to their heritage and eventually returned to Israel, rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. By that time, the northern kingdom was lost, and today's Jews stem from the people of Judah, thus Judaism. And so this is commentary from a modern uh, scholar in regard to things Jewish and, uh, and biblical. So the question then, what happened to the lost tribes? Tudor Parfit of the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies has studied the lost tribes for years and has written a comprehensive book on the subject called The Lost Tribes. According to Parfit, the lost tribes all assembled, assimilated into groups around them and eventually disappeared. At first, the people of Judah who returned to their land may have wondered about being united with the other tribes because the prophet Ezekiel even predicted that God would reunite the northern and southern kingdoms at some time in the future. In the Talmud, Rabbi Akiva is quoted as saying, just as the day goes and does not return, so the ten tribes went and will not return. Now, he says that in the Talmud. He is a Jewish rabbi. Now, I want to caution you about something. Be careful that because it speaks Hebrew or it wears a beach towel on its head when it prays or it's involved with modern Israel, that you as a Christian don't venerate that because of the strangeness of it or a supposed connection to God. These people are backslidden. They as a nation crucified Jesus. They have rejected him for 2,000 years. Just for biblical perspective. You understand what this rabbi just did. He just contradicted, contradicted Ezekiel. Well, you can have any opinion you want, but I'll stand with the word of God. Uh, the word of God is right. It doesn't matter what rabbi has said what or how many volumes has been written. He said that in direct contradiction to the word of God. However, over time, dozens of theories have come forth about the whereabouts of the tribes of the northern kingdom. It's difficult to find a region of the world that doesn't have a certain group that at some point has claimed to have descended from the lost tribes. They are in North and South America, Japan, China, Ethiopia, South Africa, India, Nigeria, New Zealand, England, Ireland, Afghanistan, and Burma. There are thousands who claim Israelite ancestry. Now, Parfit doesn't believe any of these claims, mainly because they all seem to stem from a sense of being different and persecuted. Rather than any historical evidence, he argues that these people may identify as Jews and sometimes even the approximate Jewish practices as observing Shabbat and only eating meat that's been slaughtered in a specific way. Their claims are based on legends and not on lineage. In some cases, when a minority group was persecuted, it was called Jewish to denote evil. And the historically inaccurate label stuck. Parfit's thesis is the accepted view of the academic world today and upheld by a number of other scholars in the field. And if you were, uh, if you were alive and awake in the 70s, you remember when the Beta Israel, the, uh, the uh, Ethiopians that claimed uh, uh, Danite heritage, were vetted by the, by the rabbinical community in Jerusalem, and they were deemed to be Israelis or Israelites, and they were airlifted out of Ethiopia and into uh, Israel in the, in the mid-70s. In the mid and um, so you, if, you, if you ever take a tour of Westminster Abbey, you'll, in that tour, you'll encounter some of these ideas because there is quite a large group of, uh, of experts that believe in a thing called British Israel to the degree that the queens and kings of, of uh, Britain have been coronated standing on a stone or seated on a stone that, uh, that purportedly came from Jacob at Bethel and was transported to Britain or Scotland uh, by the prophet Jeremiah. Now, now you would, <laughs> you think I'm stretching this, but I'm telling you, there are people all over the world that are invested in these stories, and so much so that that stone uh, has been uh, the last queen to be 
coronated in Britain was Elizabeth back in 1953. She's been on the throne as long as I've been alive. And, uh, and that stone was present at her coronation because they believe that. And they are looking for a sense of um, special status and they are trying to acquire it. And this is uh, kind of an extension of the creation of the Episcopalian Church by, uh, by Henry VIII when he wanted to divorce and remarry a lot of times. And the Catholic Church wouldn't let him do that. And uh, so he created the Episcopalian Church, which is essentially Catholic that speaks English. And, uh, and he is, uh, at any rate, uh, the, uh, the idea of the lost tribes is woven in. And there are hundreds of volumes that have been written. There are rabbinical writings and Christian writings and secular writings. And all the way from the 4th and 5th century forward that accept the lost tribes of Israel as a fact. And even though you could spend the next year just doing nothing but reading books and articles and watching videos and and listening to podcasts that, that present and assert that the lost tribes of Israel uh, are actually lost forever as an indisputable fact. First, it'll come as a shock to all of these uh, scholars and all of these hundreds of years of investment in this idea that first, uh, it's not true. And secondly, it doesn't matter. I'm just telling you, there are a lot of people that believe this, and there are hundreds or thousands of volumes that have been written about it. But if you ever learned anything from Noah, one is you ought to learn how to swim, or better, you, lo you ought to learn how to build a boat. But if you ever learned anything from Noah, you ought to learn that all these people can be wrong. That because everybody's doing something else, it doesn't mean what they're doing is right. Because everybody thinks it or knows it, it doesn't mean that it's accurate. And your source had better be the eternal rock of the Word of God. Let God be true. Let God be true. Let God be true in every man a liar. All right, so the Word of God is our final authority, and the biblical record is that all of Israel never stopped being represented in what would be called Judah. And so when Judah goes into captivity in Babylon, Judah comes back after 70 years, and all 12 of the tribes are represented there. Here's the biblical case. This is 2 Chronicles 11. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. So the Levites were there. That's a tribe. And he, or, he ordained him. This is Jeroboam. He ordained priests for the high places, for the devils and the calves that he had made. And after them, after the Levites came... Out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord of Israel, came to Jerusalem. I don't know how the experts, I don't know how the rabbis, I don't know how all the Christian scholars or the secular scholars miss it, but it's right here in the Word of God. All of Israel came back to Jerusalem because they took a look at Jeroboam and those calves and they said, we're not doing that. We're going back to the God of Abram and Isaac and Jacob. We're going back to the tabernacle of Moses. We're not going to be a party to what they're doing there. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong. So that when Babylon destroys Jerusalem and sacks the temple, they bring the Jews into captivity. All 12 tribes were represented there. Our text is, but as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. So there, was, there were some that were local to Jerusalem that remained there. Now, I have a, I have, well, it's just and I have 10 grandkids, and uh, they are all remarkable and, and wonderful and a delight, and God knows what he, he's doing when he gives you grandchildren. But um, Ella is a curious kid, and Ella will ask you a question, and you'll give her the answer, and then she'll say, 
But how do you know? Which, that's a good question. But it, it sure is cynical for a four-year-old. It's like, and my answer is, because I'm old. And old people know stuff. Which is not a good answer, and it's not a legitimate answer, but it works for her. And she's like, oh, old people. Then she's going to find some old idiots, and then she's going to come back to me, and we're going to have a problem. But the, the reason I know this about Israel and about the 12 tribes and about British Israel and about the coronation stone and all of that business, the reason that I know that it's not like the scholars have said is because the Bible tells me so. The Bible tells me so. Turn to your neighbor and tell them the Bible tells me so. I know because the Bible tells me so. And heaven and earth will be moved out of the way. But he said, my word will never be moved. I want you to know you can stand on the word of God. Jesus said, you build your house upon it. When the storm comes, that house is going to stand. I want you to know and understand that we've got a sure word that is forever settled in the heavens. And you can depend on the word of God. Please don't be one of those people that goes chasing after speculative things and in defiance or in ignor ignorance of the word of God. So the prophecy indicates that Israel will return. And it differentiates between Israel and Judah. I'm building a biblical case here to tell you that all of the business about the lost tribes of Israel is just made up of whole cloth and it's thin air, and they should have used the Bible as their reference. Isaiah 11, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand as an ensign or a billboard or a signal, a sign of the people to the Jews. It shall, uh, to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glory, glorious. I can't put all this together for you right now, but there's a lot condensed into this verse and it's talking about the day of the root of Jesse which is Jesus Christ and the Gentiles are coming to him which is the church age and his rest is glorious which is the Holy Ghost and uh, so in that day when God's pouring out the Holy Ghost on Gentiles something's going to happen. And what's going to happen, it'll come to pass in that day, in the church age, that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time. He's going to do this twice, and this is the second time he's going to do it. Uh, and uh, to recover the remnant of his people, which will be left from Assyria and from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from China, from Hamath, and from the isles of the sea. Where are they? They're all over the place. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations. Now he's now this is an advertisement for the nations. This is not for Israel. This is for the whole world. He'll set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel. They're not lost. They're not lost. They're not lost to God. They're not missing. They're not hidden. He's going to gather the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Where, earth. Where are they? They're all over the world. They're scattered just like he said in Deuteronomy 28. I'm a, you've been so bad, I'm going to scatter you all over the earth. And uh, Ezekiel talks about them coming back from all the nations. And here Isaiah talks about them coming back from all the nations. And do you know there's a pretty good number of them already over there. They started coming back in 1948 and then they took half of Jerusalem in the Six Day War and then they took all of Jerusalem in the, in the Yom Kippur War and friend, Israel is back. Why? Because it was written in the prophets. It was written in the Word of God and Russia can't stop it and China can't stop it and 50 million Arabs can't stop it. Well, that's right. <laughs> So God talks about this through Ezekiel, and this is Ezekiel 36. I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings. I judged them. Verse 24, I'll take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries, bring you to your own land, and I'll sprinkle clean water. He's going to clean them up upon you, and you shall be clean from your filthiness and from your idols, and I'll clean you. 26, a new heart will I give you, a new spirit will I put in you. Israel's going to get the Holy Ghost in the millennial. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. And verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my spirit. 
statutes. You know how all that Old Testament business pointed toward the New Testament experience and how the tabernacle was pointing to the tabernacle of his body and the tabernacle of the church body and how all of those sacrifices were pointing toward Calvary. And so the the existing dispensation always points to the next one. You know what you are? You're pointing the way for Israel to see that when they come back to God in the millennial, God's going to fill them all with the Holy Ghost. And you shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers. You'll be my people. I'll be your God. They were absolutely scattered. Many of them still are scattered. But they were never lost. They were lost spiritually. They were lost in in terms of they don't know their way to God. But they weren't lost to God. Let me tell you something. There's nobody out in this city today that's lost to the eye of God. God sees everyone. He sees every lost lamb. He sees everyone every lost coin. He sees every lost prodigal. And it doesn't matter who says they're lost. God knows exactly where they are. So, and God never loses what belongs to him. When he's asking Adam, Adam, where are you? That's a rhetorical question. God knows exactly where Adam is, but Adam needs to know where Adam is. It's like when you talk to your baby and you say, did you clean your room? Or you talk to your husband and say, did you pick up your socks? You know he didn't. But he needs to know that he didn't. So our text, our text overtly uh, demonstrates that Israel in the suburbs of Jerusalem stays within Judah. And when the Levites are fired by Jeroboam, they go back to Judah and then People out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem, and they strengthened the kingdom of Judah. There's another interesting prophecy that lets you know (laughs) that the the ten tribes that went to the north, they're not lost. That, That particular group of people may be lost forever, but there were representatives of those tribes, all the sons of Jacob, Uh, or Israel, in uh, and around Jerusalem at the time of the Babylonian captivity. Uh, You've heard of the 144,000. They are from every tribe. They're not lost. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes, of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Would you say not lost? Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of uh, Nephthalim were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon. Of the tribe of Levi. Issachar. Of the tribe of Zebulun. Joseph. Benjamin. They, know, they were not lost. And in the end time, God has them right where he wants them. And they're a peculiar bunch. And God puts his seal upon them. And they are the first fruit of the millennial that is to come. The prophecy is very clear that, well, there's somebody else in that verse. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, kindreds, people, tongues, stood before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand. Can you tell me who that is? Can you tell me who that is? Somebody ought to be saying, that's me. That's me. That's me. That's the church. And you know what? We're not lost. We were, but we're, we're not lost. Praise God. Jesus speaks of the 12 tribes. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that you which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, shall sit upon 12 thrones. He's talking about the the, uh, disciples or what would become the apostles. Judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He doesn't say, and you'll be judging the two remaining tribes of Israel because we somewhere along the way lost ten tribes. He doesn't say that. He said, you're going to, you're going to rule over those twelve tribes of Israel. 
And when you get down to the Revelation 21, he carried me away. This is John. Carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain. Showed me that great city, the, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like a stone, most precious, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Can't wait to see that place. And it had a great wall, high and great, and had... Twelve gates, and the gates, twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And he didn't say, and we had twelve names on there, but we had to go back, and we had to scratch some of them out, because there's only two tribes left. He didn't say that. He said there's going to be gates there, and they're going to be named for the 12 tribes. And I'm telling you, they are there. They are there. They came out of the womb of the wives of Jacob, and they are there alive today all over the world. The prophet speaks of them. Jesus speaks of them. But you'd be shocked. The libraries and the volumes written about lost things, the lost tribes of Israel. Things that religious scholars would tell you are lost. And things that all scholars agree are lost. And that these things are lost and they're archaic and they're anachronistic and they no longer are relevant and they no longer are necessary. But God knows right where they are because they're God's things and it's his ways and it's his word. And just because scholars and libraries full of scholars' works for hundreds of years can't find them relevant, it doesn't mean that they're no longer relevant in 2021. I want you to know just like the 12 tribes are accounted far in the word of God the, the, uh, the, the rabbinical community and the Christian community the historical scholarly community they've missed some things that what they will tell you those things don't matter anymore those things are lost to us today but I want you to know that just like the 12 tribes are going to be a part of the end time kingdom and they're all there and God sees them all there are some things that your world will tell you that they're lost, but I want you to know that they are not. After the apostles had started the church in Jerusalem, the church literally spread according to the word of God from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And you can see to some degree where Paul went. He wrote letters to a church he started in Rome. He wrote letters to a church he started started in Colossae and Ephesus and in Philippi and all of your New Testament epistles are letters written to those churches. But all of that, including the book of Revelation, kind of terminate in the first century uh, after, after Christ and after the apostles. And so the first century A.D. is about the length of the period of time from which we derive the Word of God. Now, 326 A.D., three centuries after Jesus, is the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church. It begins under Constantine, the emperor of Rome, and he's a pagan, and he's a Roman, and he's a polytheist. And he creates the Roman Catholic Church to co-opt what he sees as an emerging Christian movement in Rome. And they immediately begin to merge Christianity with paganism. And they begin to make idols and worship idols. And they begin to uh, denude the church of things that the Word of God uh, give you as staples of the New Testament experience. They do away with monotheism. The idea that there's only one God. They do away with the Holy Ghost like they got in Acts chapter 2 and they all spoke in tongues. They do away with water baptism and they initiate sprinkling. They, in, they institute the worship of Mary and, uh, and the worship and adoration of saints. Now you can go and there are libraries devoted to their theologies and libraries devoted to their rituals and volume after volume for centuries after centuries written to their ideas concerning the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But I'll tell you, I'll take my reference from the Word of God today. And the Word of God declares, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one.
And their records indicate that they didn't get the Holy Ghost like Peter preached. And their record indicated that they didn't baptize in Jesus' name like Peter preached. And they claim Peter as their, uh, as their apostle. And they named their headquarters building after him. It's St. Peter's Basilica. But I'll tell you two things about that. One, Peter's not there. And two, God is not there. And we could go again. The Word of God is not there. <laughs> but you could get advanced degrees at Catholic universities in Catholic theology, and you could spend a lifetime focusing on one minuscule area of theological pursuit, and you never would exhaust all the volumes and all the treatises and all the councils and all the books and all those people. Surely they can't all be wrong, but I want to tell you, let, let God be true and let every man be a liar. Somebody say praise the Lord. I'm not throwing stones at anybody today. I'm trying to lift up the word of God and the kingdom of God as is presented by the word of God. Now you get down to the 11, 1200 year mark and all that's been in Europe is Catholicism. And they are so far from the word of God. They were then, they are now. Don't give me a hassle about that. That's not mean to say that. Listen to me. We're not going to get anywhere having revival with a big, warm, fuzzy ecumenical movement. We're not going to get anywhere in God saying, I'm okay, you're okay, we've got some differences. No, the Word of God is a sharp sword, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing to the... I want you to know the Word of God is all that really matters. You get into the 11 and 1200s. You find John Huss uh, murdered in, in the streets. And you find the Reformation leaders like uh, Martin Luther and John Zwigley and, and uh, Calvin. And uh, you find them emerging or, if you would, protesting. Therein lies the Protestant movement, the Reformers. Therein lies the Reformation and, uh, and they wanted to reform the Catholic Church. And so they began to make some demands and, and offer some changes. But they, they kept the core doctrine. And so as the Protestants broke away, the whole first crowd that broke away still were sprinklers. They were all Trinitarians. None of them got the Holy Ghost. They were not representative of what was pr uh, proposed or preached by the apostles in the book of Acts. And so they, they, uh, they created what emerged and is now existent as all of your modern denominational Protestant churches. And they, they, there's a broad, broad spectrum of them, but they all have something in common. They kept the Catholic baptism. They kept the Catholic polytheism. You say, well, the Trinity is not polytheism. Yes, it is. You go back and read the Council of Nicaea. You go back and read the Creed of Athanasius, and there are three there. They don't understand it. They don't explain it very well, but they're trying to merge pagan Romanism with Christianity, and you can't do that. You just got to step out of the clutter and say, I don't know everything, but I know there's only one God, and I know that his name is Jesus, and I know that when I go down in the water, in Jesus' name, I receive his name and the forgiveness of sins. Oh, somebody glad for the gospel today. Clap your hands. Bless his name. Well, praise God. So to the world, the gospel is lost. To the world, monotheism is lost. To the world... Jesus' name and the power of it in baptism is lost. 
And you can go and spend a lifetime researching and reading the volumes. You can go down to New Orleans and you can attend the Southern Baptist Seminary there. And you can spend a lifetime. And you can get advanced degrees in this niche or in that area. But you won't ever get any closer to the Bible that way. You need to shove all that off your desk and out of your life. And you need to open up an old black book. You need to open up the Word of God. I don't care if you've got it on an iPad or on your phone. Own, but you need to open up the word of God today and you need to you need to be someone that embraces the word of God. Well praise God. You can have all sorts of things. Well, Brother Sutton, there are churches on every corner. There are thousands of them. We live in the South. There are thousands of them. Give me Acts 2.38. This is where the church began. The church began with an experience, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. It caused a ruckus in the city. The people gathered around and they asked a question. They said, they said, what does this mean? And Peter began to preach to them. And he said, this Jesus that you have crucified. And he begins to give them scripture. He begins to give them a biblical framework for understanding. And then at the end of it, he said, God has made that same Jesus that you've crucified. Both Lord, that's, that means he's the Lord God of the Old Testament. And Christ. He said he is God in a man. He is God in human form. Well, that's what Isaiah said. Isaiah said, for unto us a child is born, a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That little baby... You're telling me the baby was God, not just God, the mighty God. You, you're telling me that baby was the father? I'm telling you, he was the everlasting father. Well, how? I don't know. Well, why? Because he loved you so. Well, nobody believes that. There are thousands of churches in this metro area. And, all right, this is a hand grenade in a small bathroom. If they don't get the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, and they don't baptize in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, what did Peter say? Repent. you got to turn around. You can't stay like you are and be a child of God. Because when you turn into a child of God, something changes inside of you. And be baptized, immersed, not sprinkled. That calls a lot of them right there. In the name of Jesus Christ. You, John, John, I want you to do a study for me. I want you to just take some time and go knocking on doors at churches. Hello, I'm taking a survey today. My name's John. I'd like for you to answer a few questions, if you would please. And they may and they may not. But you say, how do you baptize? And, and they'll say, we baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And you say, thank you very much. And you put a big X by that one. Because they're using Catholic baptism. They're not using Peter's baptism. Now, I, I know how to do this because I did this myself. I went back to my old Southern Baptist church. I went back and talked to Brother Jimmy. Because he was my pastor from the time I was a little boy. I said, Brother Jimmy, I need you to explain something for me. I, I've been running into these apostolics. And they keep showing me Acts 2.38. Can you do me a favor and reconcile Matthew 28.19 and Acts 2.38? And he closed his Bible. 
Big mistake. Because I didn't know anything then, but I knew the Bible was true because we had already been exposed to prophecy. And it was like the last thing you wanted to do with me was close the Bible because I already heard all the noise I ever wanted to hear. I just want to hear what thus saith the word of God. He said, he said, I'll take Peter's word. I'll take Jesus' word over Peter. Now, if you don't understand what just happened there, he sets Peter and Jesus at odds. So Peter is the guy that in Matthew 16, Jesus gives the keys to. And my brother Jimmy in 2000, 1974 tells me that he knows more than the guy with the keys. That's what he was really saying. He was saying, I know more than Peter. I know more than Paul. I know more than Philip. I said, thank you very much. I was cordial. I'm not mean. I was polite. But I got myself out of there because I saw where Peter said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, Brother Sutton, don't you know that Matthew 28, 19 is in the Bible? I do, dear. I do. Well, don't you know that Jesus gave that commandment? I do. I ever more do. And he said, go into all nations. Make disciples of them. Teach them those things that I've taught you. And baptize them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. King James said, the Holy Ghost. We'll never get over that, will we? Well, what's wrong with Peter? Nothing's wrong with Peter. When Peter stood in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, Peter said, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. He had Jesus' commandment seared into his heart. Well, what does that mean? That means that the apostle Peter knew that the name of Jesus is the name of the Father. It is the name of the Son. It is the name of the Holy Ghost. And there's not three. There's only one. There are libraries dedicated to the Trinity, but there's no Trinity in the Word of God. There are volumes dedicated to baptism by sprinkling, but there's no sprinkling in the Word of God. There are multitudes of churches that are dedicated to baptism in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but there's nobody baptized that way in your Bible. My God, if there's anybody here glad today to be born again of the water in the name of Jesus, you ought to give God a little praise right now. Clap your hands. Lift your voice. Magnify God. Nothing in that word is lost. Nothing in that word is lost. It may be lost to them. It may be lost to you. But it's not lost to God. Clap your hands. Lift your voice. Time would not permit me today to speak of the receiving of the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking in other tongues or holiness of lifestyle or all of the things that the apostles thought to be important enough to put down in the word of God and I've had people tell me well that really doesn't matter today people will tell you all that matters is that you believe in your heart. Go home and read the book of James. 
And James, our brother, tells us, the devil believes and trembles. And he goes on from there. Well, what does that mean? That means if just believing would work, the devil would be saved. But the devil's not saved because he doesn't do the works of salvation. You've got some work to do. You need to repent of your sins. You need to go down in the water in Jesus' name. You need to receive the Holy Ghost and become a child born again of water and spirit. My God, if you're in the house today and you've never been born again of the water, never been born again of the spirit, I want you to come down to this altar. We'll pray for you. Brother Cliff, you baptized one this morning. Did they pray through the Holy Ghost? Oh, my God. Did they talk in tongues? Did you baptize them in Jesus' name? It's still real. It's still real. It's still right. Let's have a praise break, would you? We only have one service today. I want you to get I want you to get yourself loose in the Holy Ghost. somebody by the hand right now and worship with them let's give God some praise in the house right now Let's clap our hands and join and bless his name. Almighty God, worthy, worthy God, we give you praise, we bless your name. Now I'll tell you something that does concern me today. That is the lost apostolics. Apostolics in North America started out like apostolics in the streets of Jerusalem in the 
in the second chapter of the book of Acts. It started rowdy and noisy and it started loud and in the streets. First, first generation apostolic revival from Azusa Street to where we are right now has been in barns and brush arbors. It's been all over the country. It's baptized in, par in ponds and in horse troughs. It's baptized people in creeks in the middle of the winter time. I'm just telling you. But once something becomes a little more, uh, a little more mature, uh, sometimes it loses its first generation flavor. And it's easy when you're not living on the edge of the apostolic truth it's an easy thing to get assimilated into the world around you because you're not much different from them and then you get to look and they're not much different from me and you're not walking like you ought to walk and you're not talking like you ought to talk and you can become the lost apostolics we don't want that to happen do we my God, I want to be everything that they were in Jerusalem in Acts 2. I want to be everything they were in a brush armor in 1913. I want to be a fanatic about the Word of God. I want to be a fanatic about the Holy Ghost. I want to be a lover of holiness. Is there anybody here that feels that same way? My God. Clap your hands once more. Let's lift up your voice. Let's magnify him. Praise God. It is so good to be with you on a Sunday morning. We're looking forward to... Uh, fellowship tonight in and around this uh, Christmas drama. Be sure to greet and bless somebody before you leave the house of God today.